Well, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this presentation. Uh, this is the Faith of Our Fathers uh, led by Ed Cabote. Uh, Ed Cabote was the artist in residence here at the Museum of Northern Arizona and uh, we're so uh, happy to welcome him. So uh, take it away, Ed. Right on, thank you so much, uh, Darden. It's good to be here. Um, uh, my name is Ed Kabodi, and I'm uh, very grateful to be hanging out with you guys here and uh, hanging out again with the Museum of Northern Arizona. Ow, ow, ow. Anyway, um, I would like to share a little bit about the legacies of my father and my grandfather, and we'll do this via a presentation that I call Faith of Our Fathers. And so I'll be uh, sharing artwork from my father and my grandfather uh, as a tribute to them and talk about their influence upon my life, not only as artists, but also their impact on me as individuals, most importantly. So thinking about not only their professional legacies, but most importantly, their legacies of faith. This first slide is showing uh, a self-portrait done of my father, and it's a pretty profound Im image. I was three years old when he did this particular piece back in 1973. And to me, when I look at this piece, I can see three different faces of my father at three different stages of his life. But what we'll... Um, begin with is talking about my grandfather. My grandfather's English name is Fred Kabode. He's the first Kabode. Our people didn't have um, last names prior to 1900. And when our people were sent to school, then they took their name and they turned that into their last name. In the case, case of my grandfather, he was born for the Sun Clan. His clanship is actually Bluebird, but um, in our culture, we're named by our father's people, our, our father's female relatives, our aunties, our grandmothers. And so they named my, uh, my grandfather Nakabokma, which is day after day, referring to the path of the sun, which to me has a very profound um, application to the life of my grandfather, really that concept of day to day, because to me, that's the way he lived his life very consistently in front of me. But this story or, or the name rather refers to the path of the sun, just as it makes its way from day to day. He was born around 1900, Owamoya moon, that is the cleansing moon. So uh, probably around February. Um, and he passed away into the next world in 1986. He is an artist, he's an educator, he's an entrepreneur. I knew him very much as a farmer, as a husband to my soul, as a father to my father and as Kwa, which is what we refer to him as, meaning grandfather in Hopi. My Grandfather is known to the world probably more so by his murals that he did at the Grand Canyon Watchtower, um, among other things. And we'll kind of look at the, those, um, those things in the next couple slides. He did the Grand Canyon Watchtower murals back in 1932. He was commissioned by the Harvey Company. Now, Understand my grandfather's journey to this point. He's 32 years old when he did these murals. His father was arrested in 1906 for refusing to send him to school. He ran away from school till he was 15 and then he was sent to Santa Fe Indian School. While he was at the Santa Fe Indian School, he was singled out by the superintendent's wife for his artistic ability. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next coming slides. But um, his life really had gone through quite a journey by the time he did these murals here at the Watchtower. He is 
doing these murals in an old style, a cultural style. And you can see so much of his heritage in this particular piece. Um, the Watchtower has murals from, I think, four different individuals. The, the above, the, the higher floors of the tower are replicated ancient galleries, meaning that they are copied from petroglyphs and pictographs from throughout the Southwest. But my grandfather in the Hopi room was given free reign. And you can see that what he did here, you can see his background as a son of the Sun Clan. He has the sun at the top. He has the moon at the bottom. To the right and to the left top corners, he has the constant or the star of Venus in both of its forms as morning and evening star. Then you can see in the emblem, he is very keen that this uh, tower, where it's located, now it's a watchtower, so he puts the astronomy, but it's also because of its vicinity, right next to the Colorado River, he paints the story of the first guy to go down the Colorado River in our cultural memory, which is about 1500 years before Major Powell. But again, this is something that my grandfather is known for um, to the outside world. This is him um, kind of finagling here with uh, Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt. And uh, I believe this was taken at the Peabody Museum at Harvard, um, if I have that right. But uh, this was during an opening of my grandfather's uh, students and himself who had done replications of the Owatovi murals. And so this is, uh, Mrs. Roosevelt came to the opening. And uh, so, yeah, my grandfather had a very interesting life. He was actually um, a peace ambassador, a goodwill peace ambassador to India um, for the United States back when Eisenhower was president because he, I know, I, he bumped into President Eisenhower while he was down there and they met down there. Um, you know, he ran in some interesting circles, my grandfather. These are books that are attributed to my grandfather in some way. At the very top, you see Fred Kabodi, Hopi Indian artist. This was told by Bill Belknap um, or was told with Bill Belknap. It's his autobiography. And this was published back when I was a young boy, maybe back in 1976. Next to it is Field Mouse Goes to War, which my grandfather illustrated, a bilingual reader, which the government put out uh, way back to promote literacy uh, on uh, Hopi Reservation. Below, there's three other books, Tete's Memories, Swift Eagle of the Rio Grande, and Five Little Kachinas. And these are all books that he, children's books that he illustrated. One with uh, stories from the Pueblos. One is a fictional story about um, Pueblo children, a Pueblo boy who grows up in New Mexico. And then the other one is um, a series of five little kachinas and their exploits in Hopi and uh, very endearing um, books. These are all things that were on the shelves when I was growing up about my grandfather. So I, I knew certain things about my grandfather, but the things that I'm talking about right now are all things that I learned about my grandfather. You know, to me, he was a little bit different of a guy, you know, than all of these stories that I heard. Although we did hear a lot of these stories at the dinner table. Now, my grandfather as an artist, um, Wow, now he, this is, sometimes we make a lot to do of the Dorothy Dunn Santa Fe Indian School um, time period, but you need to understand that this um, was, that style, studio style was pretty much already established by the students of, that came before that. And Elizabeth de Huff, was the superintendent's wife, and she encouraged rather than discouraged 
kids at the Indian school in their culture and three young men were singled out for their abilities in art. One was my grandfather, one was Oresqua'a from Sumopave, another one was Velino Shihei from Zia Pueblo. It took a Smithsonian scholar to educate me a little bit about my grandfather's work because what was pointed out to me is if you look at my grandfather's work, it's more, it goes beyond the, the studio style, you know. All of us at the Indian school, and I'm talking as a graduate from the Indian school myself, we all engage in art out of homesickness, really. And I can see my grandfather doing this as well. But you can also see some serious study in my grandfather's work, light studies, shadow studies, perspective studies. And like I said, it took a Smithsonian uh, scholar to point out to me that my grandfather was probably being exposed to other European artists when you look at his use of perspective and full scenes, you know, rather than just um, the two-dimensional studio style known uh, uh, at the Indian school. And this is uh, a picture of the Pueblo. And this is uh, a very uh, strong feast day scene that it looks like in a New Mexico Pueblo. My grandfather spent a lot of time in New Mexico. He almost uh, referred to Santa Fe as his second home. Um, he was a jazz musician. A lot of people don't know that about my grandfather. Um, he, played, um, he played saxophone and clarinet. And uh, he uh, did a lot of big bashes during Prohibition <laughs> uh, around the Santa Fe area for the big wigs in the area. But um, again, you can really see in this picture, this is showing a feast day at a New Mexico Pueblo, and you can see the what is referred to as Santute by the um, by us as Tewa in the back, which is the saint's house. So this is honoring a particular saint on a New Mexico feast day. And so there's the dancers filing out of the kiva. You can see the perspective, things larger in the forefront, things uh, much smaller in the background, in the images of the figures very strong stu perspective studies. Yeah, this is a basket dance in Hopi, man. This is Hopi football right here, man. And uh, yeah, this is a ladies dance, you know, where the ladies are throwing out these beautifully, beautiful handmade plaques to the men. And yeah, that's Hopi football right there, man. My grandfather, I really love his imagery. I love the way he puts expression and movement into, um, his pieces. We had a few of his pieces that would hang up on the wall, you know, at uh, his home in Sumopavia as I was growing up. Uh, again, I knew certain things about him, but I really never, I, I think I remember him only doing one piece in my lifetime, which brings up the next slide. Now, this one, my sister remembered, my older sisters remember he remembers him doing this one. I don't remember this. But uh, this was done in 1976 when I was six years old in celebration of the United States 200th year birthday. And my grandfather was commissioned by somebody to um, do something to celebrate the 200th year birthday. So he did a picture of the destruction of the church at Sumopave during the Pueblo revolt of 1680, 100 years before the American Revolution. And so you can see here, they're tearing down the church and then they're also burning the priest, hanging the priest because uh, priests were in general singled out for their abuses towards women and children. Anyway, <laughs> my grandfather's work. All right, now that's the guy that I know as Kwa right there. And my Kwa to me was, a little bit detached from all of these exploits that I heard about him at the dinner table, you know, about World's Fair journeys or about, you know, meeting 
dignitaries or president's wives or presidents, etc. My grandfather lived at Tsongopavi. He was a very industrious man, but when I was young, he had no electricity or running water in his home. He worked diligently actually to bring those resources into his home. He had a large field for my grand, grandmother, her for her clanship and for her. He also had a smaller field, you know, that I think uh, was belonging to his clanship. And then he had this amazing garden, you know, there in the backyard. My grandfather, part of my language, was the most hard ass Hopi farmer that I believe I've ever known. A very traditional man, a very simple man. His life came full circle. All of these things that I heard about, you know, came full circle. One of the most important things about my grandfather's legacy, I think, is the establishment of the Hopi Arts and Crafts Guild and the training of silversmiths uh, following World War II. My grandfather was involved in a project of um, helping to train Hopi silversmiths. Of course, you know, Hopi silversmiths are training themselves. My grandfather was the, um, you know, probably had a lot to do with the business direction and also design elements, encouraging design studies. But, uh, you know, this movement went on to become the strong jewelry movement uh, that was housed at the Hopi Cooperative, maybe between like 1960 and the 1980s. I mean, hundreds of silversmiths trained there. And, uh, you know, that also later um, gave birth to the museum and the cultural center there on Second Mesa. But uh, yes, my grandfather, I remember though very differently from so much of those things that he did in his younger years. All right, well, this is a picture of my father. My father's Hopi name is Lomawawisa, which means to walk in harmony and probably a little bit of um, a joke even to my father is his journey to walk in harmony. And we can talk about that. He was born in 1942, passed into the next world in 2009. He's known as a painter, a silversmith, a philosopher, a sculptor, a poet, a father, and a grandfather. Yeah, <laughs> my pops. This is the type of work my father was doing uh, when I was born, this uh, style of work, the very introspective and abstract, you know, I think this is very much a trait of myself and my father and my grandfather. You know, I think we want to establish ourselves as individuals and not be perceived that we're building our styles or our careers upon um another's endeavors you know we want to find our individual voices and i think that's really a quest for all artists but this is part of my father's journey at that time and my father used to joke about that some people would sometimes make a remark of picasso influence in his work and you know he would laugh about it in retrospect because you know, at the time he didn't, he had never heard of this guy named Picasso. And another type of my father's uh, work in my, when I was growing up, this is the style of work that my father was doing. Um, I have some really special memories, you know, of painting with my dad. Um, my dad was a big inspiration to me as a kid, you know. He uh, sang a lot, you know, as did my grandfather, both my grandfather and my grand uh, and my grandmother, actually, and my father, you know, all, you know, probably in just like in most Pueblo homes, you know, they're all instrumental in teaching you songs and encouraging you. 
And my father, you know, when he worked, he would always be singing, you know. And a lot of times I also look at his work as songs in a way, you know, because I can imagine his movements and how he works and how he sings. And it would be really, as a little five-year-old kid, you know, it would be a great joy to be sitting with your dad, you know, doing the big boy thing of painting and rocking out, you know, singing some Buffalo songs or something, <laughs> you know. But yeah, you can also see that uh, this was during election year because right in between uh, Ahula's uh, legs there, the Katsina's legs, you can see it, for, for, for chairman. <laughs> Anyway, my father's sense of humor. This is, a, this is my father's uh, journey in his artwork here. I mean, I can see it in his artwork. Uh, probably in the 80s, you know, his, his artwork became more themed. And, you know, he went through phases. And I can see this. This is a phase I remember very much of the 80s. It was also around this time that he published a book of poetry called Migration Tears, which to me is very reflective of my father, the philosopher, my father's uh, outlook on the world, his life view. You know, he would always say that he looks at the world through Hopi glasses. And I do want to point out that this is called Faith of Our Fathers, but I also want to point out, you know, that for European cultures who trace their lineage through their father, you know, it has a different type of feeling. Of course, I'm very close to my father and my grandfather. They had profound influences on me. My grandfather and my grandmother were my rocks when I was a youth, you know, both my mother's home and my father's home, you know, were troubled, shaken by the generational traumas that our people were experiencing and alcoholism. And um, my grandparents were really grounding to me, you know. But uh, my father's journey was also very powerful, you know. And to see his own journey all come full circle. Like I say, he looked at the world through Hopi glasses and we're different people. My father is Snow Clan and my grandfather is Bluebird Clan. I'm a Badger Clan of the Tewa people. You know, our heritage, even though our last names are the same, our heritage is all different, you know. But of course, you know, their influence has really been profound in my life. All right, now, another really cool thing about my dad is his silver work. Now, I mentioned that my grandfather was very instrumental in um, introducing silver making concepts in 1948 to veterans of World War II via the GI Bill. My grandmother's brother, Paul Sufke, was the technical instructor. He was already a silversmith and my grandfather became design instructor. But one of those uh, trainees down the road from this initiative was my father himself. And I feel like my father's unique creativity really was shown in his silver. And I always say about my father's silver work, I think he was a great silversmith. But the reason to me that he's a great silver, silversmith is because he's not a silversmith. My father is a painter, you know, and that's where his heart is. And, you know, he, he also sang, you know, as he would make silver too. And I can just hear the rhythm of the saw as it would go up and down, you know. When I learned uh, to make silver, uh, many years later, or begin experimenting with making silver, I more thought of not the direction of the blade, but how the blade sounded going up and down, you know, when it's cutting silver. That to me, I knew I needed to find that rhythm. And uh, that was really helpful to me. But my father would always be singing, 
you know, as he worked. But if you, uh, again, look at his work, I think the reason he was such a great silversmith is because he's just painting on the canvas of silver. This is a, a piece that actually the Museum of Northern Arizona has uh, in collections that was donated by the family. And you can't really read it probably on your screen, but underneath this piece is the year that it uh, was issued. And this was in the year 2009. So this truly is my father's last piece of artwork. And this artwork was um, completed, you know, after he passed into the next world. He had designed a gate for the Heard Museum. And that's down there in Phoenix, a big uh, Lomawawisa gate, Michael Cabote gate that looks very much like this. But my father just really created a, a giant piece of jewelry, you know, and they were experience, he was exper experimenting with Glen Green galleries in a unique uh, water cutting process uh, to create this particular sculpture. So again, a good example of my father's silver work that's not silver work. <laughs> um, <laughs> excuse me. My father passed into the next world in 2009. And when he went into the next world, you know, that was a really big shock for me. And it was a very big burden for me. I felt like my father was in his artwork, saying the most important things of his life. I mentioned that um, my father's journey was with alcoholism, you know, he was very open about it. When I was about 20 years old, you know, maybe 18, 19, 20, somewhere in there, my father was in a, a bad, accident and that accident became the catalyst for him to really look at his life and begin to make positive changes for himself. As I mentioned, his name is Lomo Ewisa, walking in harmony. But his journey to walk in harmony was a coming full circle of many years of disharmony in his life. My father's last, the last years of my father's life were years of great leadership, of great example, you know. I mean, we're all human and we all have our feelings, but my father truly, I feel like, just like my grandfather, Nakabukma, day to day, my father also came full circle to live and personify his name, Lomawa Wisa, to walk in harmony. It was a, a strong journey that he made and it was, he influenced many people in very good ways, especially his children. But as I said, when he passed away, it was a shock to me. And I was very burdened because I felt like he was saying the most important things of his life through his artwork. In this slide here, this is uh, a portion of the mural, the journey of the human spirit that is on, currently on display at the Museum of Northern Arizona that was done in collaboration with my grandfather, brother, uh, Delbridge Honani and the work that they did on this particular mural yeah and I'm, I would encourage you to come see it come visit it it's a really strong message you know looking at our history looking at our ancient history our historic struggle with Spain our current fight against 
mining companies, you know, that are desecrating our landscape and then looking towards the future, you know, and even into his own clanship's particular prophecies about, you know, healing, about healing journey. And, you know, I just felt like he had so many important things to say. <laughs> when I came to the Museum of Northern Arizona, it was really with a very heavy heart, but also a strong sense of responsibility to my father. When I visited his home, after his passing, he had sketches that he had put on the wall, kind of like a collage of an idea, concept idea that he had about Hopi clowning. And really it was a life cycle of coming full circle to walk in harmony. That's what, that's what it is. When I looked at it, I was uh, really, really amazed, you know, by what he was saying, I heard him talk about it before, but I'd never seen him articulate it. <clears throat> and so when I came to the museum, my first objective there was to create a tribute piece for my father. And this was the piece that, um, that I did that is called Path to Balance. And it shows the baby in the womb being formed in the womb conception. Then it shows the birth from out of the ladder. You can see the koyala, the clown. I put Tewa clowns because I'm a Tewa. My father had um, in his sketches, you know, sketched Hopi clowns, but they interact with the katsina. And in a very egotistical manner though. And so they, Messengers come to them, you can see at six o'clock on the bottom of the image in the middle, you can see an owl, you can see also a raven, Patsina, because the owl is that aspect of deity that's all seeing and the raven represents that aspect of deity that can clean us, cleanse us, clean us up. And of course, we don't, listen as human beings until we get the royal beat down here at nine o'clock from Zavio in the picture. And then you can see the clown making his prayer offering there at the end, which comes full circle to the sun representing balance. So this represents nine stages of life from conception to birth, to discovery, to ego, to ambition, to dysfunction, dysfunction to destruction, and then to restoration and finally balance. When I look at the legacies of my grandfather and my father's life, to me, their most important legacy is not what they did as artists, but how they lived as people. The most profound, influence that my grandfather had on my life was just his consistency from day to day, watching the sun, planting his corn, you know, living with hardship, living steadily, living with joy, participating in his culture. And my father, you know, the profound legacy that he leaves is that full circle path coming all the way through dark side to coming back into light and then evening out into balance, you know. But uh, yeah, that's why I say I feel like the most important thing that they leave for us or for me or for their children and grandchildren is the faith of our fathers. So. Thank you guys so much for listening. Yeah, Kokwai. Thank you so much. All right. Well, one of the first questions we have is uh, what are some of your earliest memories you have of your father and grandfather? Ha. Actually, my um, 
that, I love that question. <laughs> I think my earliest memory that I have of my father, um, I have a couple memories with him, very early memories. I, I remember, I remember attacking him, you know, when he's crashed out in his bed. I remember that. Um, I remember sitting watching football with him and eating sardines on a little black and white TV screen, um, eating sardines and crackers. <laughs> and I also have a memory of painting with my father at the kitchen table. And I remember painting a buffalo dancer. And my father actually wrote a poem for it in his, it's part of the book, Migration Tears, uh, that's there. And it starts off with a quote from me that says, this little boy is an artist and he is four years old and this is for his dad. <laughs> um, so anyway, I'm grateful that my dad kind of observed that and documented it, but I have a very strong memory of that uh, myself. My grandfather, um, wow. Probably I just always, you know, have that strong memory of him um, at the kitchen table, <laughs> you know, probably after he's working in the fields and we're all gathered there and he's, he's our storyteller, you know, but yeah. So thank you for the questions. All right. Well, we got another one, actually. Um, oh, one, one of our viewers is asking, uh, did you ever travel with your father or grandfather to any of the shows or uh, exhibit openings they, they held? So <clears throat> putting this in perspective, my grandfather, again, I didn't know him so much as an artist. I remember um, maybe two functions with my grandfather as an artist. I just knew him as a very hardcore farmer, you know, that's, that's how he spent his time uh, in the, in the life of the village, in the life of his fields. But I do remember coming, it must have been at Coconino Center for the Arts here in Flagstaff. And we came into town for something, it was some type of function that he must have spoke at or done something, I don't remember. But what I do remember about that is that he and Harrison Begay, he stopped at Harrison Begay's booth and they both shook hands. And, um, and I remember that everybody around was like, whoa, you know, everybody was so affected by it. You know, Fred Cabote and Harrison Begay at the time who were both, you know, very well known as patriarchs in Native American art. And I remember that, that was probably one of the first times that I could see it with myself that my grandfather was kind of, uh, notable as an artist um, but of course my dad yeah we were with him you know here there everywhere in the market you know I mean California Idlewild School of the Arts up in Colorado uh, we tra I traveled a lot with my dad and much later in his life I had the blessing and the privilege of doing uh, silversmithing workshops with my father not only so I could learn, but also uh, to work as his assistant. And I'm very, 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 very super grateful uh, for the time that we had. You know, it, his, his passing came as a shock to me, as I said, and I'm just really grateful that we had that special time together uh, before that happened, you know. Anyway, cool. Um, Thank you so no, much. Not, not necessarily a question this time. Though okay. someone is curious about your statement about you, your father and grandfather all having different heritage. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's an important thing to recognize, you know, is that in our culture, we trace our heritage through our mother. So my mother being Badger clan, you know, of the Tewa people, my people are a Northern migration people on the Colorado Plateau, well, Northeast. And my father's people, the Snow Clan, you know, part of a, a big corn family, corn clan family. And that particular clanship comes, makes their migration many years ago, centuries and centuries ago, 
you know, up from uh, Central America. And my father's clan or my grandfather's clanship, um, you know, his, his uh, people. And of course, these are all my, this is my father and then my paternal grandfather. So, you know, his clanship. Uh, again, is is uh, a, a different clanship from his from his son, and he comes from the Bear Clan family. He's Bluebird Clan, but you know there's a large Bear Clan family, Bear and Bear Strap and Bluebird and um, etc. Spider Clan people, and my grandfather comes from that particular heritage, a very old Hopi heritage. You know what I consider to be uh, the people of this particular area, the Grand Canyon, Novatokui Obi, Flagstaff, you know, this area, and, and Hopi, this, they're very ancient people to this area. So yeah, that's what I meant. And thank you for the comment, because I think that is a, a good point of clarity. You know, in, in the European cultures, people trace their names through their father, you know, by their as indicated by their last name well as far as in 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 our practice here in the united states for sure but you know it's different on our on our on our traditional in our traditional cultures so cool. awesome well we got time for a couple more questions uh, one question that has been asked is um is any of your any of your father's works held in the metropolitan museum of art in new york Whoa, that's a, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. My father got around and um, I, I would not be surprised at all um, if there's something from both my father and my grandfather, but I, I really don't know. I really don't know. If you find out, let me know. <laughs> all right, well, another question we have um, is why did Eleanor Roosevelt visit your uh, grandfather? Uh, so that was part of a project um, that was, uh, man, okay, you put me on the spot here. I'll tell you what I know about it. <laughs> it was part of an art project of a replication of Hopi murals from the village of Owatove that Hopi students, art students, uh, were working on. and. Um, it was displayed, and again, my understanding of it, it was displayed at the Peabody Museum on Harvard camp campus, if that's consistent, I think that's right. Um, and so she came to the opening is what that was. So she came to the opening. And so you could see in the pictures that are taken, you know, my grandfather's meeting her. Uh, there's, there's various historic pictures of the event, one where he's shaking hands with her and one where he's, you know, explaining things to her. But yeah, uh, she, she seemed very genuinely interested, you know, and I think that was encouraging, yeah. All right, well, um, are you open to doing just one more question? We got a viewer here. Sure, sure, yeah, you got the time. Yeah, so if, if you can talk about it. Are the Tewa uh, Badger Clan and the Hopi Badger Clan related at all um, or in any degree? So now I love that question and here's why. Because scientists and anthropologists have made things very confused for us by their classification systems. And when I talk about my father and his clanship, you know, the box, you know, says he's this type of person, or the box says my grandfather is this type of person. Ah, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me let me think how I can explain this. So, tribe to me, a designation of tribe in Hopi. We were not a tribe prior to a United States designation of us as a tribe. We were autonomous communities, just like all the Pueblos in New Mexico, Arizona, 
autonomous communities. And these autonomous communities are made up of ancient clanships. An ancient clanship is really what we are. So just like a European will say, well, hey, my name is so-and-so, and you recognize by their last name that they're probably English or they're German or perhaps they're Jewish, you know. Now, they live in the United States and they speak English, but they recognize that their heritage is Russian and they can trace that, you know, through their line lineage and they can identify that just through their last name, very much like a clanship. So we recognize by our clanship who we are, where we come from, and where our ancient migration comes from. Among the Pueblos, and probably this is true among Navajo, but uh, Darwin can probably uh, confirm confirm or disaffirm, however you say that. But, uh, you know, we look at our clanships as definitely related, you know. Uh, people come from Russia. They don't speak Russian anymore in the United States. You know, maybe after a couple of generations, they no longer speak it, you know. But they know where they're from. They meet somebody down the road from their same heritage, their same village. They realize they have a special connection, you know. The contemporary Pueblos today are made up of many clanships, you know. You have Badger Clan in Hopi. You also have Badger Clan in Zuni, in, among the Kiris, and also among the Tewa. Now, we all speak our individual Tewa, Hopi, Kiri, Zuni languages, but we acknowledge that the Badgers at one time were all related, you know. We all have that relationship. Fire Clan, same way, you know. So I think it's something that scientists have created a lot of confusion by calling people Anasazi, ancient Puebloan, and labeling like this, us like this, and now the labeling of tribe. It creates a lot of confusion as to who we are, where we're from, and what our heritage is. So for us, it's very clear. Maybe to the outside culture, it's confusing, but uh, the clanship system is a very key part of our identity. So thank you for your question. Cool. All right, well, <laughs> I'm gonna ask one more just because people are very curious about uh, your grandfather. Now, someone wants to know the impacts of uh, Santa Fe Indian School on Fred Cabote. Wow, now that's a, another really interesting question that I didn't get into because my grandfather went to the Indian School in Santa Fe during the period that I consider the kill the Indian, save the man time period. You know, this is the time when they were run as military schools. This is the time of severe abuse, you know. Um, my grandfather being there in 1915, you know, uh, prior to uh, a lot of reform. And so the stories that you hear about children being um, disciplined, all of these things. My grandfather actually ran away from school because of his experience in schools uh, prior to. He ran away till he was 15 because he actually had been uh, in schools before and uh, had been beaten. So, you know, he ran away from that point. But at the Indian school, he was under the leadership of a renegade superintendent. And this is Mr. DeHuff and his wife, Elizabeth DeHuff. And Mrs. DeHuff was very involved with the student body, and she actually encouraged, as I said, uh, students in their artwork to, you know, express themselves, you know, express who they are, what they know, what they miss, you know, and um, they were demoted. That couple was demoted in the Indian service, and they eventually quit the Indus Indian service to work at the Santa Fe Chamber of Commerce. And from there, they kind of became um, encouragers, patrons somewhat of my grandfather. <clears throat> when he graduated from Santa Fe Indian School, they encouraged him to go on to high school. My grandfather very 
unique situation in his day. My grandfather graduated from a public high school when he was 25 years old and a uh, very, to me, high degree of education um, as opposed to, you know, the seventh grade education of the Indian school that really people still weren't able to speak in uh, English sentences, according to my grandfather. So yeah, he had a very unique experience there uh, at the Indian school. All right, Ed. Well, it looks like we are um, unfortunately out of time, but is there any, uh, any last comments you would like to make? Uh, I'd just like to, again, thank everybody for tuning in. And this is really a blessing to me. Um, I hope that um, I hope that somehow, you know, you can see the strong spiritual influences of these two men that they brought to this world. I hope maybe some of it will still impact your life. It definitely does mine. And I hope that maybe you can look back to your own heritages and be inspired by those people in your life that not only challenge you uh, by the way that they live in their work, but also the way that they live in a spiritual focus, in a conscious focus, in, in their faith. So, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much. Thank you.